decided that I'm going to share with you my victim impact statement. I have written it down so that I don't, I say exactly what I want to say in the fashion and manner in which I wish to say it. It's rather lengthy, so I appreciate your time and your patience. Um, I expect to be emotional, um, as this is my first time reading it through out loud. I can't imagine anything that I would like to talk about less, but that I would need to talk about more. I was born into the home of a serial sexual predator, and I took my first beating in the womb. Abuse has been my birthright. It shouldn't be anybody's birthright. I managed to survive a home of substance abuse, domestic violence, parental abduction, sexual, physical, emotional abuse, medical, educational, physical, environmental neglect, spurning, and psychological abuse that bordered on torture. Adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, have been robustly studied and scaled in severity. Individuals can have an ACE score of 1 to 10, and mine is a perfect 10. Outcomes in adulthood for children like me are abysmal. Lacking the average expected environment, my personhood and personality were formed not only in a lack, but in deprivation of all that would fashion growth. But grow, I did. I was clever, quiet, and compulsively compliant, all things that helped me to survive. Deep rivers of ruin ran, through my, ran under my intelligence, undermining my every effort to overcome. I tried hard to run away from the ravages, but they ran through me. I left home when I was 15, not because I wanted to, but because I had to. Previously incarcerated for sexual abuse, my father was tried for sex crimes a second time, and this time he was set free. I had every reason to fear for my life, and I did, daily. I would be preyed upon by men in positions of power over the next 25 years. Early and well-developed patterns of compliance were complicated by the very real human need to belong. Predators possess. The abused very often do not know the difference between the two. I survived a series of possessions as a student, as an employee, as a patient, and as a parishioner. I wish I had this I wish this had have been different for me and for many. I hungered for it to be different. I hunger for it to be different still. I wanted each of these individuals to be trustworthy and true, and they weren't. I met Ravi Zacharias in June 2000. And 14 at a UCB Canada businessman luncheon in Kingston, Ontario, when my husband Brad, a businessman and avid listener of RZ's work and a regular an annual donor to UCB Canada, sponsored and hosted a table. At the time, we lived an hour away, and I was weary of traveling back and forth every day to Kingston, Ontario, where I was then a mature student at Queen's University. It is my belief that RZ targeted me from the moment that he saw me. He had his assistant take my email at that event, and an online, seemingly innocent dialogue ensued for an extended period of time. Many survivors of childhood sexual abuse have a profound spiritual wound and questions about God. Myself notwithstanding, RZ appeared to me to be one of the safest, most well-respected, and honorable persons in whom to confide and seek wise counsel. His position as a global representative of the gospel was one of extraordinary and unquestioned trust. I simply had no reason to suspect that he had any nefarious intentions. I think this position of naive trust is equally understandable and relatable. I was a married mother to five children in a blended family at the time, and I was also finishing my undergraduate late in life and launching into what I considered my dream career. All during the same time period. When I met RZ, my youngest child was five. At the time of this writing, she is nearly 12. It's been well over six years since that day. I wish I had never had the misfortune of meeting RZ in person. In hindsight, attending that luncheon was one of the worst days of my life, and as you can well imagine, I have had a few. The details of the grooming process and subsequent online sexual abuse has been released in the Roy's report in a narrative that I wrote in late 2016, early 2017. To Even to revisit and retell of that traumatic time wounds me. I feel all the same nausea as the world spins in savage slow motion. I wrote them then and they still stand now. There is no need to repeat myself, nor do I wish to. 
I tried to tell a Christian counselor what was happening to me. He told me not to tell anyone, especially my husband, that he could see RZ's draw to me, and that if anyone ever found out, the kingdom of God will be irreparably damaged. I became suicidal. When I heard news of someone in our old church getting a diagnosis of terminal cancer, I longed to be her. I visited Peggy's Cove in Nova Scotia for my 40th birthday, and I researched how best to slip off the rocks and succumb to the deep. Such was the depths of my despair. It was not just what was happening to me, but whom it was happening by. I didn't die, but if wishing to die could kill you, I would be dead repeatedly. Even after the abuse stopped, I stayed in touch with RZ. He was the only person I, that knew what had happened to me. In time, I told my sister, but I was never, ever going to tell anyone else. I traveled to a counseling intensive with Jerry and Denise Basil. They were recommended to me by friends in the ministry. I had no intention of telling them, excuse me, exactly what happened or whom it happened with. When I finally disclosed to them, together we drafted an email to cut off contact with RZ and to tell my husband about the abuse. I was contacted by text, email, and phone by RZ. Once I had sent a final email to him, he threatened to commit suicide if I broke my silence. I was terrified in that moment and for a long time to come. To my betrayer, telling anyone was a betrayal. Abusers not only demand silence, they enforce it. When I disclosed the same day to my husband what happened to me, he was devastated. Brad had already had experienced a projected history of breach of trust, early abandonment and shaming, and interrupted attachments in his own life. He was crumbling at home with our children, and I was in another country in complete collapse. He wasn't sure he wanted me to come home, and I wasn't sure I would come home. No one slept that Saturday night or for many years of Saturday nights to come. Life as we knew it was ripped apart. We were torn asunder. I can hardly find the words to describe the complete and utter relational, emotional, psychological, and physical implosion that we experienced. I took a leave of absence from my much-loved work as I and we could hardly function. A handful of friends knew. We contacted an advocate who put us in contact with a trauma-informed therapist. Daily, I was not sure if my husband was going to come home. Daily, he was not certain if I would be alive when he got home. The lack of any cognitive framework of clergy sexual abuse mixed with deep attachment wounds of his own left my husband drowning in shame and excruciating pain. This led him to bitterly blame me, even as I struggled under the crushing load and weight of it all. The intensity of our individual despair, outrage, and shame drove us each intermittently deeper into despair. Our whole family was ruptured. All semblance, semblance of normal biological and relational rhythm was completely obliterated. Daily life ground down to trying not to die or to kill each other. We did not understand what happened to me, to him, and to us. It would take a full year and a half of very hard work just to establish some sense of safety and stability. Post-disclosure, we started looking at our options for accountability. What were we going to do? We could go to the media, survivor bloggers, the board, which included some of RZ's family, hire a lawyer to confront him privately, or do absolutely nothing. Given the expansive power differential and our desire for privacy, we chose to confront RZ with a lawyer. It was not then, and it is not now, about the money. It was about accountability. We held the view that powerful people who target, groom, and exploit others should be held accountable. We and our legal team underestimated the level of retaliation and backlash we would receive. RZ kept asking for more time to respond to our demand letter, and this time was granted. The day after the final extension expired, RZ filed a federal lawsuit against us, alleging that he was a victim of an, an elaborate extortion scheme for money that we didn't need. We, we were also accused of racketeering, which is still a concept I do not fully understand. We were dumbfounded. I remember when we were served with the lawsuit, I was absolutely terrified. I was certain that RZ, RZ was, had sent someone to kill us both. RZ used a former local church abuse experience where my husband and I had been victim of financially and spiritually abusive cleric to support his fantastical claim that we were a litigious couple who sued people for financial gain. 
While this narrative is as verifiably false as it is reprehensible, it was also widely parroted and propagated by RZIM. RZ as an individual and RZIM as an institution took a prior abuse situation that fractured my husband and I years ago and used that information to publicly and falsely crucify us. The consequences of trying to hold RZ to account for his abusive and predatory behavior was that my husband and I not only endured endless interpersonal atrocities, we were also publicly and widely humiliated and vilified. When RZ sued us as victims, as alleged extortionists, my husband and I were still staggering under the weight of trauma and struggling with extensive PTSD symptoms. We were horrified and outraged, outraged and had some financial resources to use. We also had limited personal resources with which to fight an individual with as much power and virtually limited resources, unlimited, limitless resources. Excuse me. We were barely surviving is what it was. RZ reported that he had a donor who was willing to fund the full cost of litigation and that this process could take several more years. To settle with RZ out of court seemed like the only viable and indeed the only practical option. Both parties signed a non-disclosure agreement and we had no idea that he would break it almost immediately. Even when he broke it so fragrantly, we were still unable to collect ourselves enough to even think about the protracted litigation process that we were promised. Being abused costs far more than ever can, that can ever be properly recompensed. It has been reported elsewhere that I had received a financial settlement from RZ. More than half of that money was spent more than half of that money reportedly received was spent on legal fees. Approximately another 33000 was spent on therapy, which is ongoing. And a further $30,000 was invested in a Master's of Child Advocacy and Policy from Montclair State University. I have also lost my annual income as a healthcare professional. Yet astonishingly, there remains those who still accuse me of being in this for the money. This false narrative was started by RZ, but it has been widely and circulated publicly and privately by RZIM and RZIM supporters. When we met RZ, we no longer attended church, but our children were still attending faith-based schools. And we took our summer holidays in a faith-based community. After the press release issued in Christianity Today on December... 3rd, 2017, it became untenable to remain in the same community. RZ portrayed my husband as a man who pimped his wife for a monetary gain. This was not only widely believed, it was also untenable and false. By March of 2018, we had decided to sell the home we built together at a loss and move to a smaller home at a higher cost in another city entirely. We left the work that I loved as a, I left the work that I, I loved as a registered health pro professional and I went to grad school to study abuse. The hope was that we could enjoy some semblance of local anonymity and daily safety and stability. I knew the world to be an unsafe place before I met Ravi Zacharias, but I yet had hope that there were some safe and sacred spaces. I no longer live with that hope. I trusted him. I trusted Christendom. That trust is irreparably and catastrophically shattered. I yet believe Christ, even if he's not true, as he is the highest ethic that I can find. They, the religious elite, stripped him, beat him mercilessly, called him all manner of names, and publicly crucified him too. <laughs> Even though I was a survivor before I met RZ, having met and come to know him was one of the most traumatizing, soul-destroying, faith crushing seasons of my life. He tore down everything that I had built that I thought was beautiful. My marriage, my husband, my home, my faith, my family's faith, my capacity to mother, my mental and physical health, and what little good repute I had, I had, and ultimately my entire career path. 
Most of what matters in life is held together by healthy relationships, secure attachments, and trust. The betrayal trauma that we incurred because of our Z and our ZIM crushed our relationship to each other, to God, and severed our connection with the wider faith community. While I am immensely grateful that we still have each other, I am grieved that we have lost so much faith, nearly all our friends, and are inhibited in the process of making new ones. My privacy has been expunged and replaced with secrecy. Never again will I be hired for work without someone regarding uh, reading about what happened to me at his hands on the internet. Never again will privacy be fully mine. I accept that as my new reality, but I will never come to agree with it. RZ secrets, sins, and public shame do not belong to me, and I verbally and publicly send them back to him and RZIM. I have repeatedly requested to be released from a non-disclosure and non-disparagement agreement. To date, no release has come. So be it. My words belong to me, and I take them back today. To my fellow advocates, thank you for speaking for me where and when I could not speak for myself. To my fellow survivors, hold fast. There is hope. There is also help. All will not always be lost. What happened to you does not have the last word. You do. It is hope. It is. It is my hope that this is my final statement on speaking on my own behalf. But I want you to know that I will never stop speaking for you on behalf of yours.